Welcome to Gerald's Deep Dive, the podcast you didn't know you needed. Welcome to Gerald's Deep Dive, the podcast you didn't know you needed. Welcome to Gerald's Deep Dive, the podcast you didn't know you needed. Welcome to Gerald's Deep Dive, the podcast you didn't know you needed. You're our host. Go! All right, so are you ready to go deep on this one? Because I think we're going to uncover something really interesting here. I am so ready. Let's do it. Okay, so we've got a whole bunch of your findings on someone or something called Jill's Studio. And honestly, this is one of those times where the backstory is almost as fascinating as the actual work. I know, right? It's like stumbling onto a hidden room full of creative treasures. Exactly. We've got music going back decades, like literally back to the days when you had to use dial-up to get online. And... It's not just a few tracks. We're talking a massive discography here. Then you've got these forays into film some early internet video projects right. and even get this custom-made VST plugins. The VST plugins were what really hooked me, actually. I mean, talk about a diverse skill set. Yeah. Right. It's like this person, or maybe it's a group, can't be pinned down to just one thing. It's music, it's a film, it's software development. What kind of mind operates like that? A fascinating one, that's for sure. And the website itself is a trip. It's like a blast from the past, totally hand-coded, charmingly lo-fi. You can just tell this jail, whoever they are, has been doing things their own way for a long, long time. Okay, before we get too far ahead of ourselves, can we just take a second to appreciate the user license agreement on this website? Because <laughs> seriously, it's one of the most brilliant and hilarious things I've ever read. Oh my gosh, yes. I was going to bring that up. It's less of a legal document and more like a satirical manifesto on modern society, copyright law, the whole shebang. It's like they took all the frustrations of living in this over-legalized digital world and turned it into art. And brilliant art at that. It definitely gives you a sense of their personality, right? Like this is someone who doesn't just follow the rules, they question them, they poke fun at them. Exactly. And that's actually a perfect segue to what I wanted to talk about next. <laughs> Before we get lost in the sheer volume of content here, let's try to paint a picture of this JEL character for our listeners. Based on what we've seen so far, who are we dealing with? Well, I think the first thing that jumps out is just how incredibly prolific they are. I mean, we're talking over 150 tracks listed in this discography, and that's just the music. Plus, there are collaborations under different aliases like Techno Burn or Said, which translates to Techno Children Are Sweet. By the way, adorable, right? <laughs> Techno Children Are Sweet. Okay, that's amazing. Right. And then there's Visuge, which hints at an early fascination with visuals maybe foreshadowing their later work in film. And let's not forget the full-blown soundtrack for a movie called The Loch Ness Monster. Yeah. This is clearly someone who thrives on creating, experimenting, constantly pushing their own boundaries. It's like they have this boundless creative energy yeah. and it just spills out into whatever medium they touch. And speaking of different mediums, can we talk about the sheer range of styles they embrace? Yeah. Because, wow. Right. We've got techno, jazz, film scores, experimental soundscapes, sometimes all within the same year. It's like they're not content staying in one lane for too long, always searching for a new sound, a new way to express themselves. Exactly. And yet, amidst this whirlwind of activity and artistic exploration, there's a clear and consistent thread, a desire to connect directly with their audience. You see it in how they provide their email address directly on their website, something you rarely see these days. Right. And even the mention of old school file sharing on Emule, it's almost like a rebellious act in today's world of curated social media feeds and streaming platforms. Like they're saying, here's my art. Find your own way to experience it. And that actually brings us full circle back to that amazing user license agreement. It's not just a funny document. It's a statement about access, ownership, the relationship between creators and their audience in the digital age. A hundred percent. It's like they're using humor and satire to spark a conversation about these really important issues. Okay, so we have a prolific, versatile artist with a penchant for direct connection and a hint of mischief. I am more intrigued than ever. What I'm really curious about is how does a single person even find the time to do all of this? Right. It's mind boggling. But that, my friend, is a question we might get a better sense of as we start to delve deeper into their discography. Onwards to part two, where we unravel the musical mystery of J.E.L.'s extensive discography. Mm. All right. So we're back and ready to tackle this musical mountain that is J.E.L.'s discography. I mean, seriously over 150 tracks spanning like three decades. That's some dedication. It's a testament to their creative stamina, that's for sure. And the evolution we see over time, it's incredible. Remember how we were talking about 
their playful defiance, well, it's woven into their music too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it's so interesting to see how it all unfolds chronologically. We start with those early collaborations like Techno Burn or Sade, Techno Children Are Sweet, which, side note, is the best band name I've ever heard. Right. There's something so pure and energetic about those early techno tracks. Like you can just hear the late 90s vibes pulsing through them. Totally. It's like stepping into a time capsule. And then there's Visuage, which again with the amazing name, but also hints at their early interest in the visual side of things. Absolutely. Like they always had a bigger picture in mind, you know? And then as we move into the early 2000s, things start to shift, right? The techno gets more experimental, a little jazz sneaks in with the alias Jella Jazz. So good. I know. It's like they're playing with genre, refusing to be put in a box. Mm -hmm. And then we get those vocal collaborations with Stephanie Rubin, which adds a whole other layer of depth to their sound. Exactly. And then there are the track titles, A Fisherman's Farewell, Tremor Boy, Space Beauty. They're so evocative, like little glimpses into a bigger story. Okay, yes. The track titles. That's where things get really intriguing for me, because you start to see these recurring themes, these little breadcrumbs that J.E.L. is leaving for us. Space dreams, love, night. These words pop up again and again, creating this kind of interconnected web of meaning. It's like a puzzle, right? They're giving us these little pieces and inviting us to put them together. And speaking of puzzles, can we talk about polyrhythmic time travel to February 29th, 1888? Yeah. And what is happening in that song? I need to know. Right. It's so specific. February 29th, 1888. What is the significance? It's like a musical riddle. And I'm here for it. And then there's a fisherman's farewell, crying ARP Odyssey version. Even the title evokes such a specific mood. I know. It's haunting, melancholic, beautiful. It makes you wonder, did a fisherman's farewell start as a film idea, then a song, then it evolved again? Because that seems to be how J.E.L.'s creative process works. It's all connected, right? And speaking of interconnected, we can't forget about their most recent work, the Loch Ness Monster original motion picture soundtrack, a full-blown film score. Okay, yeah, that's major. Talk about a creative lead. It makes you wonder, is composing for film the natural next chapter for J.E.L., especially yeah. considering the thought-provoking titles we see in their filmography? Oh, for sure. Titles like Nearsighted with Tinnitus and Disturbing Energy, Ghost of Fukushima. Those aren't exactly lighthearted rom-com titles. You know, this is someone who's interested in exploring the darker, more complex side of things. Absolutely. So we've explored this incredible musical landscape, but what does it all mean for our listener? What should they take away from this deep dive into J.E.L.'s discography? That's a great question. You know, I think the key takeaway here is that JEL's music is more than just a collection of sounds. It's a testament to their constant evolution as an artist, their willingness to experiment, their playful defiance of any kind of label. Yes. And let's not forget that mischievous, playful side. Dropping a title like Polyrhythmic Time Travel to February 29th, 1888, that's just fun. It's like they're inviting us to play along, you know, to yeah. unravel the mysteries woven into their work. But it's not just about the music, is it? Right. J.E.L.'s exploration extends beyond the realm of sound and into the world of film and technology, which is actually a perfect transition to part three of our deep dive, where we'll explore how those worlds collide. It's amazing how seamlessly J.E.L. moves between these creative worlds, right? Yeah. Music, film software like it's all part of the same language for them it's that interconnectedness we keep coming back to and that playful defiance that refusal to be put in a box it's everywhere totally so let's talk about those films for a minute we've got these early experiments sigurd the thing yeah. already the titles alone are intriguing right mysterious evocative like they're hinting at something bigger and then you've got those collaborative videos listed too it's like they've always been drawn to the power of the moving image and again, we see this evolution, right, from those early experiments to more mature work like Nearsighted with Tinnitus. I love that title, by the way. So J-E-L. It's brilliant, isn't it? And then you've got Disturbing Energy, Ghost of Fukushima. Clearly not afraid to tackle some heavier themes. <laughs> no, not at all. Which brings us to something I wanted to circle back to, that technical detail about the auto loudness plugin. 18 different methods for adjusting loudness. Come on, that's next level. Right. To even conceive of that level of control over audio dynamics, it speaks to a deep, almost obsessive understanding of sound. And when you connect that back to the music, to the film titles, even to that incredible user license agreement, it's all connected. It's all JL. 
A hundred percent. So speaking of that user license agreement, can we just take a moment to appreciate the genius of that document? Please, let's. It's like they took all the absurdity of the digital world, all the legal jargon and copyright craziness, and turned it into this hilarious, thought-provoking work of art. It's satire at its finest. And that, quote, fair play means fair for all, not just fair for those rich enough to hire expensive lawyers. I mean, come on. Right. It's a powerful message about justice, equality, access. They could have just slapped on a standard legal template, but where's the fun in that? Exactly. They're using their platform to spark a conversation, to make us think critically about these issues, and they're doing it with humor and wit. Okay, so we've explored JEL's music, their films or software, even their legal documents. What does it all add up to? What's the takeaway for our listeners? I think it's this. JEL is a true original a creative force who refuses to be confined by genre, medium, or convention. They're constantly evolving, constantly pushing boundaries, constantly inviting us to see the world in a new light, and they're doing it all with this incredible sense of playfulness and humor. They're like a digital age renaissance person. You know? Yeah. Music, film, technology, social commentary, it's all connected. It's all part of this grand interconnected creative Vision. Yeah, exactly. And the best part is we're all invited to be part of it. So to our listeners out there, if you haven't already, I urge you, go check out Gel Studio, get lost in the music, explore the films, and definitely, definitely read that user license agreement. Trust me, you won't regret it. And I said it better myself. And on that note, until next time, keep exploring, keep digging, and keep those digital discoveries coming. Because you never know what incredible treasures are waiting to be unearthed. All right, everybody, get ready for a deep dive today. We're going full on digital archaeology. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Full on digital archaeology. So you sent this uh, this collection of what you called code snippets. Yeah. And um, honestly, I was a little I was a little intimidated yeah. when I first opened this up. I was like, oh boy. Um, but then I saw this this phrase, Gel Studio. I was like, okay, all right, now we're talking Gel Studio. This sounds this sounds like um a mystery. A mystery wrapped in an enigma. Right. Wrapped in code. Right. And and that's what we're here to unravel. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah, it's like we stumbled onto the blueprint, the digital blueprint of a long lost, maybe even forgotten creative project. And we don't even know what it is yet, do we? Exactly. That's the exciting yeah. part. It is. It is. And the more we dig into this mainframe console, which I love, by the way, yeah. the more we see that this wasn't just some random code slapped together, you know? This this points to something, something deliberate, oh, something coming. intentional. Oh, yeah. And and someone, some creative entity yeah. wanted to take us on a journey with it. OK, so where do we even begin? We've got these commands, dot load, <laughs> dot run. Now, to the average person listening, that might sound like, you know, just computer gibberish. But these were like these little breadcrumbs telling you, hey, there's more to be found here. This is interactive. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And let's not forget, this is, you know, we're talking about a time when the internet was not what it is today. Downloadable content, interactive experiences, those weren't, you know, a given. No. This was cutting edge. So when you see these commands, what, is that, what does that tell you about who Gel Studio was? I think it tells us they were ambitious, they understood the potential of this new technology, and they wanted to push the boundaries of what you could do creatively, you know, in this digital space. Mm -hmm. And the content categories they listed just kind of drive that home, don't they? Oh, absolutely. I mean, music, video, software, even movies and television. Mm. We're talking about a multimedia, a smorgasbord. A buffet. Yes, a buffet of creativity all yeah. in one place. And and, and that's, that's before we even get to what I think is the most intriguing part of this whole thing. What's that? Software. Listed as its own category. Oh, yeah. Not yeah. tucked away under music or video. No, it's front and center. It's its own thing. And that, that just sparks so many questions for me. Yeah, what is it? Exactly. Was it software for creating art? Digital tools for other artists? Oh. Or, or was it... Was it something else entirely? Something we haven't even thought of? Right. I mean, was it trying to like build a community around this? Like, you come for the music, you stay for the the software, the tools. It's possible. And think about it. Back then, the idea of sharing creative tools online that was groundbreaking. It was like they were saying, "Hey, 
we're not just here to showcase our own work. We're here to empower other artists. Yeah, that is fascinating. Isn't it? And that sense of community, of collaboration, it just it permeates this whole mainframe console thing. You know, even the way the content is organized. Oh, okay. How so? It's very deliberate. You've got your discography releases, official sites. It's like they've created this, curated this meticulously crafted directory guiding you through their world. It's true. Hmm. There's a There's a flow to it, isn't there? There is. Like those old school websites that we used to, we'd click and we'd wait. Yeah, with anticipation. And be like, ooh, <laughs> what's, what's this going to take me to? It's so true. And then just when you think you've got a handle on it, you get to this instruction. And this is, this is one of my favorite parts. It says, touch for full screen. Ooh. Now, what does that tell you? It's interesting, right? <laughs> because we're so used to clicking now or, or tapping. Right. But yeah. touch for full screen, it's, it's almost... It's almost sensual. It's evocative. Like they wanted to create this immersive experience. Like you're reaching out and touching the art itself. And imagine this, picture this for a second, a dimly lit room, maybe a projected installation, the glow of the screen reflecting in someone's eyes as they explore this digital world, or maybe a touchscreen kiosk, allowing for a more tactile, more intimate interaction with their work. It's, it just, it adds a whole other dimension to this gel studio mystery. It really does. It, it's more than just the code, isn't it? It's the feeling, it's the, the intention behind it. Exactly. And you know, just when you think you've deciphered it all, they hit you with one final clue, one that could potentially unlock even more secrets. Oh, what's that? An email address. No way. Gelstudio at hotmail.com. Are you serious? Hotmail. Hotmail. Plus a Twitter handle, https dot slash twitter dot com slash JLS studio. It's like an open invitation to connect. To like reach out through time and space. Exactly. Imagine being able to click on that contact us button today, sending an email to that Hotmail address. I mean, who knows? Right. Maybe we get a bounce back. Maybe we don't. But the fact that they included it, it tells you they wanted to hear from people. They wanted to share their creation with the world. We've gone from cryptic code snippets mm -hmm. to envisioning a full-blown multimedia experience, mm. potentially a whole community of artists, maybe even a, a way to reach out and touch the past. It really makes you wonder what else is out there, doesn't it? What other digital treasures are waiting to be unearthed? What other stories are waiting to be told? And on that note, I'm going to have to check my old floppy disks, see what I can dig up. That's going to do it for this deep dive. Be sure to check back in with us next time when we, well, who knows what we'll uncover. I'm excited to find out. to gel deep dive the podcast you didn't know you needed welcome to gel deep dive